Hey guys, Michael Corsentino with my top tips for speedlight success. So let's dive right in with my number one tip, and that is going to be to get your flashes off your camera. Uh, that is going to be one of the main things that you're going to do to take your speedlight lighting technique and lighting technique in general really to the next level. As I say in the article, with your flash on camera, you're locked in to very flat lighting. Now, the minute that you take your flash off the camera, you're able to introduce varying degrees uh, of shadow and direction to your light by virtue of the angle that you place that light in relationship to your subject. So, for example, if we look here, you can see a, a a, an image that has a lot of shadow in it and a lot of drama in it by virtue of the placement of each of the lights. This is a simple two light setup using speed lights, um, zooming the flash head, which we'll talk about also. That's another one of the things that, that you should definitely be investigating uh, is manually zooming the, the flash head. But in any event, so I've got a light here and that is providing the light here and giving me shadow here on this side of the face, all of this is falling into shadow. And I'm only able to get that because I have removed my flash from the camera. If I had my flash on the camera, we would be looking at a very different, uh, and I would argue a very boring flat image, and all of this stuff in the back would probably be going very dark and black. Um, you know, just uh, not ideal. Um, so if you're looking for drama and you're looking for more sophisticated, more interesting looking images, one of the first things that you're going to want to do is to get your flash off the camera. And you'll see here we have a second flash placed here and that is illuminating all of this, giving us this nice rim light here. Sorry to scribble all over our beautiful model but uh, for the sake of uh, telling you what's going on. All right, let's move on. So once you take your flash off the camera, you're gonna need a way to communicate uh, with between the flash and the camera settings and telling the flash exactly what you want it to do. So for that, we use radio triggers or triggers in general. Uh, you'll have optical triggers and radio triggers. I am going to argue for radio triggers. I'm gonna make the case um, all the time that you should be using radio triggers. And here's why this image perfectly exemplifies when radio triggers uh, are, you know, far surpass what you can do with optical triggers. And the reason why is because optical triggers require something called line of sight, meaning that each of the flashes or the camera and the flash need to see one another in order to communicate. With radio-based triggers, you do not have that limitation, okay? It's because it's radio frequencies. So you are able to do things like produce images like this, where I have a flash behind this wall, right behind here, on these stairs up here, placed right around there, and that is illuminating this, giving us this nice edge, this nice rim light on our model's hair. All right. Now, if I had an optical communication setup going on here between the camera and the flash, I wouldn't be able to trigger it. It wouldn't see the, the beam of light, it wouldn't be able to read it, and I would not be able to hide that flash to tuck it behind this wall and get this cool lighting effect. Again, here we've got cross light going on, we've got another speed light, actually it's more like up here, pointing down, and that's giving us our light here as well. Okay, so two things, cross light, but also using radio triggers is gonna allow you to really create sophisticated lighting by placing your speed lights anywhere where that you want them, all right? So, also talked about large octas. Uh, again, a large octa is great because it's pretty much, well, it's gonna do several things. It's gonna give you a wide area of coverage. And you can see here I had my octa placed here with two speed lights in it. Now, I'm not gonna overpower the sun like I said in the article. Um, uh, the sun is up here and it's kind of late afternoon. Um, but what I am gonna do is be able to get a nice wide amount of coverage because it's a large modifier. I have the modifier nice and close so I have a nice soft quality of light uh, to the light and I'm getting just a nice kiss of light. I'm just opening this up and providing a nice pop uh, on the lighting for them. 
All right. Now I could do the same thing with a large umbrella. Uh, I think I've covered the Westcott seven foot umbrellas uh, in some of my features. Uh, they weren't available when I made this portrait, uh, but those would also be a really perfect solution for this. I'd probably shoot it, uh, use it as a shoot through. Uh, so it had a nice diffused soft light and uh, a nice broad light. Uh, so you're not going to get the kind of control that you'd get out of a softbox in terms of where the edge of that light is because the light kind of goes everywhere. But in certain circumstances, this being one of them, that works just fine. All right, let's talk about other kinds of modifiers. We have portable softboxes. I've called out a couple of my favorites uh, in the article. I am partial to some of the last delight uh, easy box range of softboxes and octobanks. In this image, I've used two, and I'll tell you exactly where they were placed. I put one here with one speed light for our male model, and then there was one over here, and that's used to light up Kimberly. Uh, and what I also did here, and again, that's the Easy Box Softbox. They come in a bunch of different sizes. It was the two, two 20 board, 24 by 24 inch softboxes, each with one speed light in them. Uh, and over on top, above, I've got, again, very portable um, Lastolite Skylight diffusion panels. I think it was actually two. And that is blocking the sun, which is coming up from above and would have been creating a really nasty highlight all down here, right? So I just got rid of that, took that out. It created a nice kind of open diffused softbox look uh, from above. Not really for him because he was under a, a, an overhang, uh, but for Kimberly. Um, and then we just filled in everything um, using a uh, nice uh, fill light from our soft boxes, right? And so we've got this really nice, sophisticated kind of lighting created very easily and very portably, uh, all with speed lights. Amazing, speed lights are pretty incredible little tools. Okay, so next thing, uh, let's talk about zooming the head to really confine the light. Okay, with your speed lights, when they're used off of the camera, you're able to control them manually. You're able to control the zoom that they're set at manually. When they're on the camera, they're gonna match the focal length of your lens. Meaning that if you're using, let's say, a 16 to 35 zoom lens, if your lens is set at 16 millimeters, so will your flash. If your lens is zoomed to 35 millimeter, so will the zoom of your flash be, okay? But off of the camera, you can set it to whatever you want. So I am always at, or I would say most of the time when I'm doing this kind of portrait, I'm at the maximum zoom ratio and that is going to be 200% in my case for the Canon 600 EXRT. I'm gonna be zoomed into 200% and what that's going to do is it's going to confine the light to a nice pool, a nice circle of light, and everywhere else it's gonna to start to fall off naturally. Essentially a vignette, and you're able to create it in camera without having to use uh, software to do it, okay, which is great. And you can further accentuate that kind of thing by using grids. Um, Lastolite makes grids. I think there's, there's a kit called the Strobo Kit, which I talk about. Um, Expo Imaging makes grids. There's a whole range of companies available that make fantastic uh, speed light modifiers. So grids are another way, and I've used both of these techniques in this image. So let's start with our key light. Our key light is illuminating Ashley here, and what this is doing is it's just so set to 200%, and again, what that's doing is confining that light, okay, to a nice narrow space. And everywhere else, that light is starting to fall off. And we've got an accent light here, that's a second light, that is also confined, but it's confined using a grid. This is, in this case, a 20 degree grid spot, all right? And that is just creating this nice small pool of light which is falling on, on her shoulder, and it's falling on her hair, all right? And then on the background, we also have another speed light with another grid, and that's going to create a nice pool of light on the background, okay? So it can give me some illumination, but not shotgun approach, not have it everywhere, all right? So zooming the head and using grids, okay? There's all sorts of modifiers. This is bare flash on the, um, on the key light, by the way, all right? And typically that's a technique, that zooming technique is a technique that I'm going to use with bare flash, not with a modifier, all right? All right, let's talk about gels, creative use of gels. Now I've used this in many instances which I've talked about and I'll feature later 
uh, as, a, as an accent for the hair. You can use gels. You can use a CTO gel to warm up the hair. I think I talk about that in the article. You can also use gels for all sorts of creative applications, and I've done that here simply by using two flashes. I've got my key light, obviously, lighting up this portion of our model, right? And then to create something really unique and different and really add some drama and some color to the image, on the speed light in here behind these doors, I've got a red gel. All right, and that is going to light this whole room up and give it this cool red uh, color cast. And it's going to give a little bit of uh, red over here on our model's hair. So just another really cool way. Just have fun with it. Gels are amazing. Uh, we'll cover some of the other ways that I typically use them to add a little warmth back into the hair. You can also use them uh, when you shoot your speed light through a diffusion panel. If you want to bring back a little warmth, maybe that's missing on an overcast day. There's just a ton of ways to use gels. So definitely check out gels. All right, portable studio and auto sleep. Okay, so I talked about auto sleep uh, in the article, and auto sleep is one of those things that can be a real gotcha. And I learned about auto sleep and how to uh, how to turn it off during this shoot. Okay, so let's talk first about portable studios. Again, the reality of a portable studio is something that has been realized by all of these super cool, lightweight, portable tools, many of them collapsible. Uh, in this case, I was using a Westcott Apollo. This is just a one light uh, image, okay, with a fill reflector and a collapsible black background. I made this in the back room of a crowded restaurant where these uh, veterans, World War II veterans, were have their monthly meeting. Um, so I didn't want to have them in the studio and intimidate them. I wanted to go where they were in a comfortable space for them and make these portraits. So these portable tools really allowed me to do that. So I had my Apollo over here, camera right. Uh, I put a little bit of construction paper on either side just to create a strip light. So I wanted a real narrow kind of shaft of light. Um, uh, one speed light in here, just firing through. Um, and I'm able to get this really cool, you know, dramatic kind of quality of light. It was, you know, about 45 degrees off to the side. Um, in the back here, it was a Lastalite collapsible uh, white and black background. They come in all sorts of sizes. I favor the five by six. It's easy to travel with and easy to work with. Um, and there you go. And then we had this, you know, just beautiful quality of light. It was simply and easily. Again, one light. Uh, I believe I had a fill reflector on this side just to open up some of the shadow here. It was getting a little too dark. I didn't want split light, but I wanted a dramatic light. Uh, but I, again, I didn't want to take it too far and make it too dramatic. I still wanted some of those open shadows. So just a white reflector over here is bringing back in some of that light on this side of the face, all right? Um, and so we talk about this auto sleep feature. Okay, so I've got my Apollo here. I've got my speed light and it's all tucked inside there. I can't really get to it. I'm shooting and all of a sudden my speed light is not working. What is going on? I've got these people, they're looking at me, they want me to make their portrait, they, they've agreed to do this and I am like freaking out because my speed light won't fire. Okay, so here's the thing, and this is what I learned, and it's going to save your butt. Your speed light in custom functions, there's a way to turn off the auto sleep feature. When you have your speed light on your camera, it's going to allow you, when you press the shutter button, it's going to wake it up. Okay, all good. It just sends a signal through the hot shoe, boom, your speed light's awake, and you're off to the races. But when you take it off the camera, it doesn't work that way. Okay, there's no signal that goes through. They have all sorts of other information that's, you know, travels from your speed light, from your camera to your speed light. Unfortunately, waking it up is not one of them. All right. So you need to turn off that auto sleep feature in your speed light. Okay. It's, you'll find it in custom functions. Just turn it off. And remember that one of the things is you're going to burn a lot more battery power because your speed light's always going to be on. So have some extra batteries on hand. But you'll definitely want to disable that auto sleep feature when you're using your flash off camera. It will definitely uh, save your butt and keep you from those heart pounding moments that I had to experience the hard way. All right. So next thing. Uh, okay. So people ask me all the time, well, you know, I'm just starting out and I, I need one tool, one light modifier. What should that one light modifier be? That's a really hard question to answer because it's okay. Well, what kind of light are you, do you want to create? What are you looking for? What's the char what characteristic of light are you trying, trying to create? What kind of portrait, what kind of image, what, what's the application? Okay. That said, again, there's no one size fits all light modifier. However, 
if you had to start with one tool, one really super flexible tool that's going to give you a lot of options for an extremely reasonable price point, that's going to be a convertible umbrella. And one of my favorites is the Westcott 43 inch convertible umbrella. Umbrella, Because what it allows you to do is you can use it for shoot through, you can use it as a bounce back, you can use it with white fabric inside, you can use it with silver fabric inside, and it's going to allow you to create a variety of effects with one tool. Okay. Now again, the thing with umbrellas is that light is going to go everywhere. So here I have a simple two light setup, two speed lights, or actually three speed lights. I've got one convertible umbrella, that Westcott umbrella, right, like this. And I've got two speed lights in here because I want some extra power and I want quicker recycle times. Okay, that's going to be one of the benefits of ganging up flash. Now what that's going to do is that's going to send light everywhere. Okay, it's going to give me a really wide pattern of light. But that's fine in this case. That's what I want. I want all of this illuminated. I want all the garments and I want her illuminated. So it's going to work here. I don't need a, a rapid fall off of light. I want light everywhere. And I can always add a vignette later in software, which I, you know, tend to like to try to get things in camera, but sometimes you'll add it in later in software, and I believe that's what I did here. I've also got a second light, and we talked. I talked about this before when we are talking about gels. My second light is here with a full, or I think it's a half cut of CTO gel, right? Color temperature orange gel, and what that's doing is just adding a nice warm highlight on Carrie's hair right over here. All right, so one tool, the first tool to start with, check out a convertible umbrella. They rock. They're going to give you a lot of options, a lot of op um, creative possibilities. All right. All right. Next thing is going to be understanding how exposure works uh, with ambient and flash together. I've talked about this numerous times. Definitely refer back to all my articles uh, over, the, over the past year. I talk about this often. But basically, when you're working with ambient and flash, you've got two zones of light. Okay, You've got your ambient light. That's one zone. And you've got your, the, your artificial light, the light from your speed light. That is a second zone. All right, And they're controlled independently. They're both controlled using different settings on your camera. So the rule of thumb is this that your ambient light is controlled by your shutter speed. Okay, that's going to allow your sensor to collect more light or less light based on how much time the uh, shutter is open, right? Um, and then your aperture uh, and your flash exposure compensation are going to control how much light is contributed from your flash. All right, and again, I could spend an entire article on this topic, so I, I'm going to be brief, but definitely other articles have covered this in depth, so check it out. But just remember, ambient and flash, shutter speed controls your ambient, flash exposure compensation and aperture is going to control your flash. All right? Simple enough. Don't overcomplicate it. All right. Last but not least is high speed sync. And this was, I think, two months ago, the feature topic. Uh, so definitely refer back to that. But I just want to say in brief that what high speed sync is super cool and you definitely need to check it out and start working with it. Don't be intimidated by it. It's really easy. Basically, in a nutshell, all that it's going to allow you to do is give you tremendous flexibility with your shutter speed. Okay. When you're working with ambient and flash, you are going to reach what's known as your maximum sync speed with your camera. And that means that you've reached the top shutter speed at which you can use flash with when you're working uh, on when you're working in ambient light or in any light. You reach that top speed for your camera for, for, for flash. But in actuality, once you switch into high speed sync mode, you can take it all the way up to one eight thousandth of a second. Now, why is that important? Well, I'm going to tell you why. Because what it allows you to do is, if you see these three images, you can see here that we start we start on the right, or I'm sorry, we start on the left with an image where I've got a key light here, and that's lighting up our model. Um, but I need to use a really narrow aperture like f11 or f16 or somewhere around there in order to balance all of the light in order to keep the ambient light balanced and to keep the um, and to keep the flash balanced all right and i'm at the top end of my uh, of my shutter speed i'm at 1 uh, 1 one twenty fifth of a second here right now if i want to um, if i want to open up 
my aperture and blur out that background, get a soft background, what am I going to do? I can't make up the difference. There's nothing I can do. I've reached my top shutter speed, so I need to be able to balance the exposure another way. And high speed sync allows you a number of things, but one of the things that it allows you to do is to flip the whole exposure around. Okay, so what do I mean by that? What I mean is that I'm able to and here again, I believe I'm at f11. So here I'm able to go four stops the other way. So I'm able to use, I forget exactly what this was, but I'm able to use, let's say for argument's sake, a shutter speed of one eight thousandth of a second. I think it was more like a 3200 for this, if I remember correctly. One thirty two, one th one thirty two hundredth of a second. And then I'm able to open, use 2.8, or somewhere around there, f2.8 for this, right? So all of a sudden, I've got the look that I want just by using high speed sync. I've been able to go work with shutter speeds higher than the camera sync speeds, and now I'm able to open my lens up and create this beautiful soft look. Now I can take it a step further and I can create a really dramatic kind of day for night look by just, I'm still at 2.8 here, I believe, and you guys can check the article. I don't have it in front of me, so forgive me if my numbers are wrong, but you get the point. Now, I believe this was one eight thousandth of a second. And what that's done, again, shutter speed controls ambient, is I've taken the ambient down. I've knocked down the ambient even further than it is here. You can see that sky has gotten much darker, right? So I've created this cool, dramatic look, and I've held the sky, and I've brought in those clouds and created something very dramatic. Again, high speed sync rocks. Check it out, all right? All right, guys, those are my top tips for Speedlight success. Check them all out. If you have any questions, hit me up on the Facebook group. Happy to help. I can't wait to see what you guys create. Until next month, this has been Michael Corsentino for Shutter Magazine.